Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, Phil the Geek, as he'll henceforth be known, bombarded us with numbers, many of them scary, such as that our, that our national debt is careering towards an eye-watering £2 trillion. And because he said Brexit is partly to blame, the Rees Moggs and other members of the Brexit bunch accused him and the Office of Budget Responsibility of getting their sums wrong. John McDonald and Labour, remember them? Accused Theresa May of giving too little jam to the jams. That's those who used to be called hard-working families. And one of the great political figures of the last 50 years who taught Jeremy Corbyn everything he knows about style, died aged 90. Allegra, Screeny, I assume, like me, you still have a Che Guevara poster on your wall. No, Robert, it's a bit before my time. But look, this morning, the papers are dominated by the death of Fidel Castro, summed up by the indie revolutionary icon despot. On Twitter this morning, the left-wingers are debating the rights and wrongs of the man. Jeremy Corbyn's ally, Clive Lewis, tweeted this. Clive Lewis on this programme last week. I'll go with Mandela on this one, amigo, these two brothers in arms. But then elsewhere, Chukramuna, one of his opponents, um, interesting reading the Castro obituaries. In the end, I'm a Democrat and I find it hard to see past the fact he was a dictator. Now, elsewhere, the Sunday Times have the first in-depth and personal interview with our great leader, Theresa May, about getting the best deal on Brexit. Here, she admits that the Brexit challenge keeps her awake at night. We're glad to hear it. Now, here on the front of the Telegraph is her plan to crack down on uh, business. This in particular includes the proposal that they would get companies to publish the difference between pay at the top and at the bottom. Now, she has to have something to say on high pay because, as we learnt this week, everybody else's pay is in for a tough time. We were told before the autumn statement that that would be a mini-budget for those just about managing the jams. Was it? Well, have a look at this. Um, this the blue lines are what everybody got pre the autumn statement, the, the situation before Wednesday. And these are the five poorest um, income groups. Now, look at how the autumn statement changed things. Look at how the jam was spread around. This is essentially the square root of not very much at all. This line, this black one, shows for the poorest five household income groups, their income is down. This was not a grand slam for the jams, Robert. Thanks, Allegra. In a moment, I'll be talking to the Work and Pension Secretary, Damien Green, but first I'm delighted to be joined by Labour's Lisa Nandy and Dominic Raab from the Tories. Um, this morning, we've seen Theresa May channelling uh, in a Ed Miliband, perhaps her inner Fidel, who knows, but talking about um, how she wants to see workers on companies pay committees uh, and also she wants to see companies publishing the ratio of bosses pay to workers pay in a way to sort of curb bosses pay. Dominic, um, somebody I think of as being a sort of proper Tory, what do you think about this? Well, look, I've got no problem. In fact, I like the idea that what's happening on a, at a shop floor level uh, for workers' pay is reflected in their voices, reflected in their concerns, reflected in the kind of decisions on the remuneration. But this remuneration is the kind committees. of interventionism that Conservatives typically hate. Well, there you go with your typically and your prejudices. Look... No, it's not a prejudice. I'm, it's not, not the slightest, right, but, me, I'm, me, but I want to know what you think. But, well, I, I think it's a perfectly reasonable idea. I also like okay. the idea that shareholders get a binding vote on executive pay. Shareholders, investors own the company, not the, the, the executives right at the top. So, actually, that's something, if you look back, I've been calling for for quite some time. Lisa, uh, how happy are you that Theresa May appears to be putting on Ed Miliband's clothes here? I think it's brilliant. I mean, and listening to Dominic, you know, last year when we were talking about introducing pay ratios and curbing executive pay, we were told that this would collapse the economy and the Tories accused us of being anti-business. And now suddenly it seems we've got I a new cross-party consensus. I think these are far cry consensus. from, from, uh, from Ed's proposals. But look... No, they're, they're not. They're, no, they're no, almost they're identical. No, 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 show me the difference. Show, show me the difference. OK, well, let me tell you why I support that. First one's about transparency. Who could be against that? The level and the discrepancies between top-level pay and average pay in a firm. 
that's a sensible idea. You see it in places like America, supposedly the hotbed of, uh, of capitalism. And on this issue of executive pay, I think shareholders should actually take more of a grip on what's going on at the top issue. Workers actually of being firms. involved in the debate about how much people get paid? Is that a about, good thing? It's about having their voices heard, and I think I've got no problem with that at all. Well, it's not about having their voices heard. Well, that's actually. what the proposal it's about, is. It's about real power, and it's about shining a spotlight on the fact that we've got a very low wage economy, which is devastating, not just for economic growth, but for the reality of people's Real lives. We'll have, we'll have more of this yeah. in just a couple of minutes. Now, even before she set foot inside number 10, Theresa May said that she wanted to improve equality between workers and bosses. She'll set out her plans in more detail next week, but from what we know, it sounds, so far sounds rather reminiscent of Labour policies launched by Ed Miliband. Well, in a few minutes, I'll be speaking to the shadow chancellor, John McDonnell. But I'm joined now by Damien Green, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Hello to you. Good morning. Um, before we start talking about Theresa May's crackdown on executive pay, um, I'm keen to get your thoughts on the news that the FA is to be launching a review into these allegations of abuse in football. Something you welcome? I, I, I do. I think, I, I hope the, the football authorities have learnt what other institutions have learnt, and far too many uh, have been affected by this sort of uh, terrible uh, scourge of, of, of child abuse, is that transparency and investigation and finding the facts is really important that, that anyone uh, who tries to, to push this aside uh, that's just wrong. There, there are too many instances that we've seen you know, in, in you know, the BBC with, with Jimmy Savile in, in the churches uh, and so on that, that you know, let's get to the facts. Thank you. Um, let's talk now about the policy announcement from Theresa May, this crackdown uh, on inequality between the pay of workers uh, and their bosses. At a time when the UK is about to leave the European Union, should we not be trying to make the UK as business friendly as possible? And we are, and, and successfully so. We've seen in the last couple of weeks a huge raft of international companies who can, who can put their business and, and business HQs anywhere uh, saying that, that they want to expand in Britain. Google, uh, Apple, Facebook, uh, Jaguar Land Rover, who are owned by, by the Indian group Tata. So absolutely Britain is and, and needs to remain business friendly. But what the, the proposals that will come out in the Green Paper are about are making sure that people have faith in the, the capitalist system, that they can see that it is working for everyone and, and not just a privileged few. And that's why the idea of publishing the gap between the highest paid person in the company and the average earnings uh, in that company is so important. So it feels that everyone uh, working for a company can feel that they're participating in the success of that company. Are these reforms slightly toothless though? You're asking people to publish the pay, you're also saying that workers can be in the room when pay is discussed, but do they have any block uh, if they're really unhappy by the idea that some of the executives or the fat cats are getting too much? Well, one of the other uh, proposals which we'll be consulting on uh, in the Green Paper is to uh, allow shareholders to have a mandatory vote. But will uh, so in, workers be involved in that or is it just company shareholders? Well, in the end, it's the shareholders that own the company, so it's it's their company, it's not it's not the senior manager's company, that's, that's the legal position. Uh, and often the problem in the past has been that the shareholders um, haven't had the power or in some cases the inclination actually to uh, protest or, or to say, look, we, we don't find this acceptable. So this will give the power to the shareholders. But I think it will be important to have um, a voice in the room, as you say, in the, in the remuneration committee, the committee that decides the pay of the top people in a company to have uh, the workers represented there to, if only to make the point that now we have transparency, now we'd have the facts of what the, the difference in pay is between the top and, and the middle of the company, that, you know, that will have some force. It sounds an awful lot like some of the things that Ed Miliband was suggesting at the last general election, uh, policies that the Conservatives derided as being anti-business. I'm just looking uh, at some of the 2015 Labour election manifesto where it says that there should be employee representatives and remuneration committees and that pe the pay ratio should also be published between the highest paid and the average in the company. Are you just nicking Ed Miliband's policies? Well, well, I mean, there, there, are, there are slight differences, but if, if the Labour Party wants to support this, uh, then fine. What, you know, what, so what, why didn't you support Ed Miliband what, what, uh, when well, he was I suggesting say, our, our proposals are uh, slightly different, but I think we've, we've seen around the world, I think there's a really serious issue here, that a lot of the, the protest votes, if you like, that we've seen in various countries around the world are about people um, losing faith in the thought that, act, you know, what, what 
you know, most people in this country, uh, maybe not Jeremy Corbyn, but most people have believed that a sort of liberal capitalist system not only creates more wealth, but helps spread more wealth. That's the, the argument that was won back in the 1980s. And it's clear that we need to win that argument again. And to do that, we need to make as sure as possible that everyone benefits uh, from the system and that they can see that it's fair. So this is, this is squarely in line with what uh, Theresa May said on the, the steps of Downing Street when she first became Prime Minister. So is that your lesson from Donald Trump's victory in America then, that you need to prove again to people that capitalism works? Well, not just that, but I mean, clearly a, a lot of what lay behind the Brexit vote in this country was people feeling dissatisfied with the system more generally. And we've seen it in, in other European countries as well. So I think making clear that uh, capitalism works for everyone and not just the people at the top um, is a very, very important project for this government. Let's talk about the autumn statement. In the space of a few minutes, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, raising uh, the national debt more than Gordon Brown did in his whole chancellorship. Are the Conservative Party now the party who can't be trusted uh, with the economy? Well, no, because we are bearing down uh, on uh, the deficit. Uh, we, we're not doing it as quickly as we originally thought we could because of you know, various uh, uncertainties well, George Osborne's and, austerity and program has been ripped up effectively. Well, it's not been ripped up. I mean, we're still on a, a steady downward trajectory. We're not going to hit, if you like, the, the, the end of deficits by 2020, but we'll do so in the course of the next Parliament. And any uh, Chancellor faced with a very uncertain uh, situation around the world uh, will, will, will want to make a sensible balance between continuing to, to bear down so that we live within our means, but also finding the money for the essential things that will keep Britain open for business, keep Britain attractive internationally, hence the, the 23 billion uh, fund for productivity improvement, which will um, include uh, a lot of road schemes, but also a lot of uh, other kinds of infrastructure, like, like more modern broadband and so on. The things that make us an attractive country uh, to do business, which allow us to create the jobs. We, you know, we have a historically very good uh, level of uh, employment. One of the um, areas that soaks up a huge amount of public money uh, is pensions. Can you guarantee that the triple lock is here to stay for the next parliament? Well, I can, I can guarantee it's here to stay uh, for this parliament because that's the only uh, sensible guarantee any politician can make. We, we had it in our manifesto, that and other uh, benefits for pensioners and, and we will stick to that. We will stick to our manifesto commitments. It's too early sitting here in 2016 to write the 2020 uh, Conservative uh, manifesto. So you know, that, that would all have to be decided in future years. But, but it is absolutely here for this Parliament. Do you think that it's a bit of a tempting uh, amount of money for ch the chancellors to have a look at and think, hang on, there is something that we could squeeze? Well, I, I think, oddly enough, I think the idea that uh, if you look at a deficit now and say, end the triple lock, that, that, that wouldn't make any difference because uh, it, it's, it's money looking further out that you're spending, uh, that people are considering. But I think um, a, a lot of the, the, the debate on the triple lock is, is slightly simplistic because one of the things that's happened in this country that we, we haven't noticed and should do because it's very good, uh, and this is a non-partisan point, it, it takes, it's taken place over the last 30 years, is the reduction in pension of poverty. In the 1980s, 40% of our pensioners uh, were living in poverty. We've got that figure down now to 14%. And I think that's a huge uh, beneficial social advance in this country. Potentially and partly I, because the, uh, I, the deficit's been reduced on the back of younger people as opposed well, to older I, people. I, I, I absolutely take the point about intergenerational fairness. But, but you know, let's pause and look at what we've done for, for people to allow them to have a more dignified old age and, and not do anything that puts that at risk. Um, a quick thought on Brexit. It's, of course, the issue that is looming large over this um, parliament. I know that the government doesn't want to give us what they call a running commentary, but I wonder where you'd position yourself uh, on things such as the single market debate. If you have Philip Hammond potentially arguing in favour of access to the single market and others like Liam Fox saying that we need to be prioritising trade deals, where would you put yourself on that spectrum? I, I think the, the problem with the debate is that it's, it's often binary, that you're either pro single market or let's get out altogether, you're pro the customs union or let's get out altogether. And as the government, as we're, we're working through the individual problems, they're not as black and white as that, they're not as binary as that. There are elements that are beneficial to us, both of the single market and of the customs union. And we're looking at whether you can actually 
uh, keep uh, as well obviously we want to keep as many of the advantages as possible while at the same time uh, allowing us to have control over our own borders that's the, the you know the, the debate that we're having internally but the idea that, it, that it's black and white that you're in and out of these these different bits of the institutions uh, it's it's I'm afraid more complex but than is that. that realistic that you can have a pick and mix approach particularly at a time when with elections looming next year in Europe people are going to want to show that you can't simply have your cake and eat it well of, of course they they were, were at the, the pre negotiation stage now where where people will will issue tough statements and as you say particularly with elections coming up uh, next year but I think there is a sensible negotiation to be had uh, which will be as beneficial as possible to Britain and as beneficial as possible to the other members of the European Union clearly in any negotiation both sides uh, need to get something but if you talk to European businesses in particular they want as little disruption as possible and so I would hope that the political leaders in other countries will be listening to their own businesses because there are, there are many businesses that have supply chains across many different European countries including this one. I'm interested um, as well um, after on the back really of Theresa May's quite revealing interview that she's given to the Sunday Times clearly trying to show the public a bit more of who she is as a person. Now, I think I'm right in saying that you're her oldest friend around the cabinet table. Can you give us a bit of a sense of what gets Theresa May out of bed in the morning? Uh, what was she like at university? Oh, the, 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 the people constantly ask me, what, 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 what's Theresa really like? To which my answer is always the same, which is what you see is what you get. She, and, and, and was true of her uh, when she was a student as well. She's a hard-working, conscientious, serious-minded, but also... You know, good fun to be with. Um, there, there is no sort of hidden Theresa May that the, the public doesn't know about. There, there are clearly details and you know, Theresa uh, can, can talk about them. But uh, uh, And she's also uh, talked about her husband, Ther uh, Philip May, uh, in mm. this interview too, even saying that he helps her choose her outfits. Yeah. At university, did you ever think Philip May was the one more likely to go on to be Prime Minister or was it always clear that it would be Theresa? Uh, they're both, I mean, they were both sort of, I mean, they were friends of mine for, for a long time uh, and they're both very talented. I'm sure if Philip had wanted to have uh, a career in politics, uh, he would have been extremely successful. Um, but I, I assume they took the, the sensible decision that, that one politician in a family uh, was, was probably enough and that they'd, they'd go into different spheres and, and Philip was extremely, is extremely successful in business. Damien Green, thank you. Thank you. Um, and now I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the Work and Pension Secretary, Damien Green. Very good to see you. Good morning. Um, so, We've just been chatting a bit about um, people on lower pay. One of the really striking things in the Treasury's analysis of the impact of government policies is that those on lowest pay are going to be quite a lot worse off, particularly as a result of the benefit changes introduced by, your, by George Osborne when he was Chancellor over the next few years. As a sort of very much a one-nation Tory. You must feel very uncomfortable about the thrust of government policies making the poorest worse off. Well, it's not making the poorest worse off, in so fact. So the Treasury's the, analysis the people, is wrong? Well, the Treasury's analysis... Any, any of these analyses are, are static. They assume that if you're in one position, you always stay there. And the whole point of the welfare reforms that we're doing is to make sure that more people can get from out of work to in work. We've been hugely successful in that. We've got more people at work in this country than ever before, more women at work, uh, fewer children going up in workless households than ever before. And also, and crucially, the, and I think this is part of the next stage of welfare reform, allowing them to progress in work. We used to have a welfare system that um, forced people to decide that if they were working 16 hours a week, should they take on an extra five or six hours because if they did they might be worse off because they'd lose all their welfare benefits the introduction of universal credit allows people to progress seamlessly and indeed one of the uh, reforms that was announced in the autumn statement makes that even more uh, valuable for people they can keep more of the extra earnings they get without losing their, their this, benefits. This, this reduction in the so-called taper which as you say means that people can keep more of their universal credit as they earn more money from their jobs. That's going to cost the government about £450 million, pounds, according to the Treasury's own figures, whereas the, cut, whereas the cuts to universal credit that George Osborne pushed through is taking £4 billion 
away from poor people. What we needed to do... So, yeah, so, 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 you know, people will be hugely worse no, off. No, because they're, they're, they're different groups of people. Um, what we've done, the, the, what the, the, the previous cut was to what are called work allowances. So they're yeah, that's right. uh, very much to, in, to encourage people to get into work. We are doing... And very, limiting what you can get if you, if, if, to just two children. But, but we are doing... Uh, very well at getting people into work. What the, the reduction in the taper does, which is effectively a tax cut uh, for people uh, on universal credit, is that that will affect everyone uh, on universal credit. Now, when that's fully rolled out in a few years' time, that will be three million households. So that will be far more people who will be beneficially affected. And when, again, I mean, the, the figures you quoted of the, of the 400 the four million... The million, yeah. The, no, the 400 million, the, the, the universal credit benefit. Um, yeah. That's because, at the moment, we are still rolling this out. We've got about 400,000 people but it's still uh, receiving peak universal at 700, credit. But it's still going to peak at 700 million, and four billion is a permanent... Yeah, but it's about eight, eight, 800 million a year from, from 2020. So, well, but it's also four that. billion a year it's, it's, was taken it, away from. It was. It was. It so, was, you, I mean, you just are not it, giving it, back it the amount that, for example, Ian Duncan Smith says you ought to give we're, back. We're, we're giving back to a wider group of people and it specifically encourages people to progress in work. I think that when you've got uh, historically low unemployment levels, the, the next group of people you need to help are people who are um, probably not working very many hours, to encourage them to take more and more work as it's available, as well as encouraging people who are not employed into work. I think that's a, it's a wider group of people, so you can help more people with this type of reform. You also inherited cuts to payments of the disabled under the ESA. Are you comfortable about that? We, the, the, the cuts to one particular group of people uh, receiving ESA are to enable that benefit to be the same as job seekers allowance because the, the big problem there's been uh, with employment and support allowance ESA has been that when it was first introduced um, by the Labour government in 2008, uh, their estimate was that about 10% of people would be put in a group where we accept that, that, that their disability means that they can never work and so basically the state gives them benefits and then ignores them. Actually that number's not 10%, it's 50%. Now that means we are losing a lot of potential. A lot of people who, who want to work and could work are not being helped well enough into work. So uh, the money that's freed up from that will enable us to spend a lot more on helping uh, people with a long-term health condition, with a disability, into work. That's why uh, we produced a green paper two or three weeks ago, jointly between my department and, and the Department of Health, because we need to change both the public and private sectors radically to help people with a disability into work. The health service needs to get better, my department needs to get better, and also employers uh, need to change their attitude. This is a big, I mean, on, on the health service aspect of all of this, Stephen Dorrell, who I would think you'd have a sort of pretty similar political outlook uh, to, um, said today that it's a disgrace that you didn't do more on the social care front. Well, we're now doing a lot on the... Uh, social care fund. We've got the, the Better Care Fund, which will release more than £5 billion uh, of extra money. We've allowed uh, local authorities to put a uh, precept to raise extra money uh, from their council tax. And so both of those, there'll be very, very significant uh, sums of money during this parliament going into social care. Absolutely, it's a problem. There are a million more uh, over 75s mm. in the population. On, on, this, long, on, this, long, on this longevity that. issue, people living longer, one of the most striking things that Philip Hammond said was there was going to be an across-the-board review of the impact on the public finances and public spending of people ageing. Now, that was taken as a signal that the so-called triple lock, which is the guarantees to people on pensions, um, may not last through the general election. Do you think it's likely that the triple lock will go? Um, I think it's far too early to start thinking about uh, what happens uh, in our manifesto for the next election. The triple lock is guaranteed uh, till until 2020. It's, but it's, it's possible. It is po What's and your also, personal view well, about the well, triple well, lock? Do you, are you view, in favour of the triple my lock? My personal view is that the, the debate um, is often a bit binary. And what it leaves out is one of the tremendous successes. This is a non-partisan point. It's mm. happened under governments of all mm. types. That in the 1980s, 40% of British pensioners were living in poverty. That figure is now down to 14%. Now, that's a huge social advance, which we don't celebrate at all. Now, uh, the the nobody, lock... nobody would disagree that that's a, 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 a tremendous advance, but on the other hand, all the analysis, and this is not sort of the biased expert of so-called terrible experts, all the analysis shows, particularly since 2008, those 
retired have done really quite well and younger people have done really badly. So people are saying, actually, we've got to start helping younger people. Well, I, I think the, I mean, the problem with that, I mean, I, I take the point about intergenerational fairness, but lumping all old people, there are 13 million people who receive the state pension in this country, together and say, oh, they've all done well and young people sure. are doing badly. That's, but it that's does quite sound to me as though you're, It does sound to me as though you're open to the idea of the triple lock could go. Well, I, 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 I'm not writing uh, our manifesto for the next election, sadly for you, Robert, uh, on your programme uh, in 2016. It would be premature and we'll need to see what happens to the economy between now and 2020, apart from anything else.